Hello, I'm Doug McAward. I'm a producer. And the reason I'm here came about a couple of years ago. It's a bit of a long story, but here's the Reader's Digest version. A friend of mine in Kaplan, Louisiana, Carlin Hanks, had a friend in Lufkin, Texas, Rick Hendry, who had a friend in Tetlin, Alaska, Danny Adams, that wanted to open a duck hunting camp. Danny Adams is the chief of the Tetlin tribe of the Athabascan Indians. They own approximately a million acres, 200 miles south of Fairbanks. This might sound like they're economically well off, but nothing could be further from the truth. Most of these people there live a subsistence lifestyle. That means they live off the land. They can trace their roots back some 15,000 years, but they only recently put a road in 12 years ago. Before that, it was, if you didn't have a bush plane, it was a 25 mile ride down that river to get in and out of that village. I couldn't wait to go. After spending a few days hunting ducks in the middle of nowhere by day and being mesmerized by the aurora borealis at night, Chief Danny invited me to his moose camp for a couple of weeks. Some people may have certain qualms about hunting in general, but you've got to understand that if we weren't successful, there would be a lot of people in that village starving that winter. I met a lot of people over the next few weeks. Some of the elders would come visit us for a couple of hours, some for a couple of days. They would talk about the old days and share their stories about growing up Athabascan. I was fascinated by their stories. Their culture, their music, their lost language, and their ability to survive all those years in a harsh place that most of us could never imagine. I knew right then that their story needed to be told. I made four trips back to Alaska since then, and on two of those trips I brought a camera with me to start shooting this project. Last September, my wife Linda and I spent three weeks interviewing everyone from chiefs in Tanacross and Tetlin to professors at the University of Alaska Fairbanks to Athabascan musicians, to Gwich'in authors. You can't find a more friendly, generous group of people anywhere. And it's about time everyone out there gets to hear their story and learn about the part of American history that belongs to them. These natives won't be able to tell their story without your help. Take a look at our 10-minute trailer and let us know what you think so far. Thanks. History is written by the victors. Ownership of this quote may be in question, but no one can dispute its accuracy, especially when it's applied to modern-day Indians and their vanishing culture. The Indian tribes inhabiting what is now known as Alaska settled there some 15,000 years ago. Other than missionaries and a few trappers and traders, the white man was virtually non-existent in these territories before the mid-19th century. In this part of America, the relationships that developed between the white man and the Indian were far more peaceful than in the lower 48. There were no bloody battles like those associated with the settling and taming of the West. In Alaska, there existed a different kind of war, a culture war that still brews to this day. I've, I've been raised with my uh, Athabascan way of thinking and, and, and the tradition, and I, I, I think that is why I am a stronger person today, because like any other ethnic group, you have to have a culture, you have to have a meaning in life. You have to have that link to where you came from and what your, what your culture means to you. And, and it's un, unfortunate that we live here in this, this country here, and yet our language is dying. Our, our, our dignity, our, our self-perseverance, our, our just everyday simple goals is, is being challenged by lack of knowing who we are and where we should be with this tradition and culture that we were taught all our life. This culture war began in 1885 when Sheldon Jackson, the Interior Department's general agent of education in Alaska, insisted on the elimination of native languages and the replacement by English. Sheldon Jackson very much advocated an English-only policy. And it is this English-only policy 
that began just around the turn of the 20th century and, and continued in for the entire first half of the 20th century. And the English-only policy basically was a policy to eradicate native language use. And it continues to this day with the Fish and Game Department's attacks on the Indian subsistence lifestyle and their attempts to outlaw, among other things, the solemn potlatch ceremony. Today we still run our own fish and wildlife. We do our own thing on the land as a tribe. See, in 1940 we were established anyway. And the state became a state and they want to push their jurisdiction on us, uh, which we don't recognize them. We just say, hey, we don't recognize you. We were here already. There's 236 federally recognized tribes here in Alaska. The tribal governments are federally recognized tribes in the eyes of Washington, D.C. And uh, for them to be able to exercise their sovereignty, they have to be educated. They got to know what's going on. We're always, as Native people, I think, going to hold our culture precious to ourselves. You know, we love our stories. We love our moose meat. We love our fish. We love our beadwork. We love our, our elders. And that's always going to be with us. It's going to be with my children because they got that. You know, they got that that nuance for me. Culture is dynamic, right? The fact that fiddle traditions can arrive and be adopted into an environment, and that's a good thing, I think, right? That culture is dynamic enough to absorb that and to embrace it and create something new and create an entirely new Athabascan fiddling tradition. You, sometimes you'll hear a jig being played by somebody like Bill Stevens, but Bill can also play um, the Yellow Rose of Texas or um, Eagle Island Waltz, or one of these other tunes that is, Eagle Island is an indigenous tune, but it's in that western swing tradition. We adopted the fiddle, our way of life, and the dancing that went with it. And native people, Kuchin people, have been dancing since time immemorial, drumming and dancing. Culture interrupted is a term that adequately describes the native experience in Alaska. The introduction of modern technologies dramatically altered the subsistence lifestyle that had been their only means of existence for centuries. These new technologies now required the use of dollars, a currency that had never existed before. This forced the natives to live between two worlds. Time when I wrote the book, I see there's a couple of different cultures. This is your culture. You guys are caught. This is my court. Most of my people are over here, see, between two different cultures. But I can't be white, even though if I got a college education, that will make me a white man. No, I'm still native person, Indian, I'm over here. That's where I'm at, way over here. What I'm trying to do, sir, is what I'm trying to get my people back over here little ways so they could hang on to what little we have. I knew that I had to get the Western Society of Education, which is the greatest thing that i ever done, and yet hang on to my tradition, because whether I'm in a city or an urban area where, where, or I'm at a moose camp or I'm back home with my, uh, in my village stuff, I, I, both sides works for me. I like to think of um, technology and products being assimilated into our culture and how we use it. But we still don't intend to let go of our subsistence lifestyle. So as much as my heart is still in Fort Yukon and by the Yukon River and, and my heart is still with the land in Fort Yukon, I, I kind of am in the self-exile for my children's sake now because I know that they would have a harder time in the village simply because when you're gone too long and you don't come from there, you have to acclimate. And, it's, and, and whether you're a native person from that village or not, it's almost like you could be from New York City when you try to try to reintroduce yourself into back into your culture. There's so many aspects of the culture that are described by the language. The language is, is ideally um, fitted to the culture so that the vocabulary that's needed to describe specific um, cultural aspects of, of any group is, is there in the language. The normal chain of transmission is from parents and grandparents to children and grandchildren. That's how things usually work. It's how language works. It's how traditions work. But uh, their tradition has gotten interrupted by uh, economic change and political change. It was not until 1992 that we got past 
the first U.S. Native American Language Act, which stated for the very first time that Native American languages were fully as American as English itself. The Morris Thompson Cultural and Visitor Center opened in 2008 in Fairbanks. The center's mission is not only to educate, but also to preserve and celebrate the art and culture of the Athabascan tribes of the upper Tanana region. We really want to get our young kids back on track to learn traditional cultural values, to learn their native language, to learn their native dances. We want our young kids to learn to know how to put potlatch on so 50 years from now they could do a potlatch for their own kids or their own family. The potlatch has a very long history and importance in native culture. It is a solemn ceremony practiced by many in Alaska. It can commemorate a particular event in one's life, be conducted in honor of a loved one, a first successful hunt, the return of an individual after a long absence or illness, and the most solemn being the death of an individual. The whole system is endangered. Uh, it, there used to be a great deal more knowledge among families of who belonged to which clan, and the, the potlatch system is based on clans helping each other and serving each other. And if you don't know where you belong, then it's really difficult to set this business up. It's very sacred to potlatches to us. It, it, it has a very significant uh, religious uh, and ceremonial uh, way of doing things so that we can keep respect for one another in, in our culture and to keep our traditional way of uh, identifying who we are and what family and tribe we belong to. Depending on the notoriety of the honoree, a potlatch can be a long time in the making and be attended by hundreds or even thousands of people wanting to pay their respects. Sometimes potlatches take six years after the death. It's just because of the availability of uh, putting that potlatch together. Uh, it's not the cause that people are concerned about, it's just that they want to make sure they do it right so that they, they honor the person in the right way. The state of Alaska has the highest percentage of indigenous population per capita, almost 18 percent. In some ways you can describe Alaska as the crossroads of the continents that you had here with the Bering Land Bridge, a, a pathway for settlement of, of North America through which all peoples passed. And they probably didn't pass going 60 miles an hour in a car. So that meant they spent a good time here. So in a way you have, you could argue if you wanted to be kind of Alaska centric that, that all peoples in North America were once native Alaskan. Fortunately, in recent years, there has been a concerted effort by some to restore a way of life and the traditions that were infringed upon during this culture war from history to music and language to culture, there is much to learn and celebrate.